Yeah. Check. One, two, three. I think it's working. Yeah. So if anybody can take their seats and maybe if the participants of uh, this panel, oh, with Vala and Anna just sit next to each other. Uh, so uh, thank you for those. Make it so she can hear. Oh, sorry, yeah. Uh, thank you for those who just joined us for our last panel. Um, uh, our next panel is the Can the Provinces Speak? Mainstream Mean Peripheral Narratives and Perspectives on Ottoman Armenians. Um, we will have Nora Bayramian um, from UCLA speak first uh, uh, through Zoom. And then we will have uh, Anna Alexanian uh, from Clark University and Barak Kestemanian from Princeton University. Uh, and finally, we will have um, our discussant, Lena Ekmekciolu, uh, from MIT, speak uh, uh, on the papers. Um, so I'll uh, leave, uh, Nora, you can share uh, uh, your PowerPoint if you'd like. Um, and you have these Okay, let me move. Okay. Thank you. May I begin? Yes. Yes, you can begin. Yes, you can begin now. Oh, I'm so sorry. Hello, and thank you for uh, allowing me this opportunity to speak about this uh, topic. I'll be, I'll be. Um, in 1861, Armenian intellectual Dada Kujan published an article in the Constantinople based periodical Mosses where he defends the disproportionate number of deputies from Constantinople in the Armenian Assembly, writing, Constantinople must have priority since the progressive and educated elements of the nation are there. The great strength of the nation is there. 19th century Ottoman Armenian elite overlooked the importance of the Ottoman borderlands despite the fact that it was home to 80% of Ottoman Armenians. The spies from the 19th century has maintained itself in contemporary academia, resulting in a severe lack of study of the, Ar of the Armenian periphery. To confront this neglect, I propose to shift the narrative of the center to the periphery by examining provincial Ottoman Armenian short stories of the 19th century. Studies of Armenian literature mirror the understudied nature of provincial Armenian <coughs> history. When discussing Ottoman Armenian literature of the 19th century, academic interest veers toward the center with people of Zonab, Siamanto, Daniel, Babajan, and a coterie of their contemporaries producing from the major cities. Rarely are authors like Arik and Sivandia, Smibin, Rupen Zakarian and Tilgadinsi studied with such alacrity, in spite of the vital role they played in the development of the provinces as well as the role they can play in our understanding of the often complicated life on the border regions of the empire. In their article on borderlands, Pekka Hamailovin and Samuel Truitt note that borderlands are ambiguous and often unstable realms where boundaries are also crossroads, peripheries are also central places, homelands are also passing through places, and the endpoints of empire are also forks in the road. Borderlands are dynamic if overlooked regions which can serve as nexuses for cross-fertilization of ideas. Studying Armenian populated border regions far from the more stable and administrative centralization of Constantinople allows us a new perspective. I will thus recenter the narrative by assessing select short stories of Armenian authors who hail far from the center. Hoban is Harukunyan, known by his pen name Tilda Dinsi, and who bends up in order to examine the development of nationalist discourse and to demonstrate the importance of this neglected region and literature. Now the question arises, why the short story? The short story has a long tradition in Armenian history blossoming in the Middle Ages with the secularization of literature and culture. The short story came in varying forms, including the fable, Ada, tales, Siluids, and the fairy tale, Hekja, each with its own stylistic specifics. As such, the long history of the short story and the familiarity of the genre allowed for it to become an ideal medium for writers of the provinces such as Tilgadinsi, who were as yet less familiar with the literary conventions of the novel of play. Tilgadinsi and Zakhtaya wrote in a period of turmoil, turmoil of the Ottoman Empire. With the signing of the Treaty of Berlin in 1878, issues of administrative reform in the provinces became increasingly important. This newfound tension catapulted the Armenian issue onto the international stage and provided a catalyst for more Armenians to consider their national fate. 
Accordingly, it was not long after the Russo-Turkish War that the uh, first bands of what, will, uh, what would today be called guerrilla fighters were formed. Two of the primary parties within the forthcoming Armenian Revolutionary Nationalist Movement were the Hinchagan Revolutionary Party and the Armenian Revolutionary Federation. Though their priorities and ideologies varied, one important method they shared was the use of demonstrations in order to gain, gain international attention to the plight of the Armenians on the borderlands. One of the more notorious examples was the Ottoman base operation conducted by the ARF in 1896. 26 young revolutionaries seized control of the bank and threatened to detonate explosives should their demands not be met. Following the incident, angry mobs took to the streets in retaliation. Nearly 6,000 Armenians were killed. This is an example of the cycle of action and reaction which would be pertinent in the forthcoming discussion of Tolgadensi's and Zagfayan's works. Today we will examine two short stories, Toward the Sun, written in 1911 by Tolgadensi and Lord Hiras, written by Zagfayan and Dana Noh. I will use these two short stories to gauge the development of nationalism within the Armenian community, as well as use it as a base which, from which to we can exp uh, extrapolate conclusions about what was occurring within the Armenian Millet. Both Tilgadinsi and Zagtarian were born outside the center of the Ottoman world. Tilgadinsi was born in 1860 in the Tilgadin village of Hafet, where he gained his moniker. Zagtarian was born in 1874. <coughs> Uh, in the province of Severe, and then moved to Hafet, where he eventually became Tilka Dinsi's student. Tilka Dinsi, with rare exception, did not leave this region, or move to the century to adopt the cosmopolitan ways of the elite urbanite. In contrast, Zagtayan spent much of his life in his native Hafet, yet he did also eventually move out and spend time in the center where he was heavily influenced by revolutionary ideologies, even joined the ARF. This difference between the two authors is evident in their writing. Tilka Dinsi was pragmatic, focusing solely on the development of the army and villages and towns. He viewed the ideologically motivated activities of a small group of young Armenian revolutionaries as brash. He believed that flamboyant acts in the center, which antagonized the state, would have reverberations in the less supervised villages and towns of the border and lead to further repression and inter-ethnic tension there. Conversely, Zakhaya, as we will soon see, was much more sympathetic to the burgeoning revolutionary movement. We will begin our analysis by turning to Tilda Dinsi's short story titled Toward the Sun. The story tells of a somber man who is making his way on foot to see the wise sun. At the outset of the story, the reader is unaware of who the man is or what he wants to ask the sun, only that there is something which weighs heavily upon him. On his way, he comes across various communities of people, each more woeful than the last. A representative from each community asks the man to tell the sun of their own problems. The representative from the final community tells the man that when he needs the sun to yell, we are dying, we are already dead. The soldier promises each group that he'll take their message and continues on, his, head, his heart heavier with each encounter. At last he comes across an old woman sitting alone among ruins, with only a picture by her side. The man feels compelled to approach the old woman. The woman says, For centuries I've sat at these ruins, but I'm going to finally die. Know that I used to have as many children as there are stars, that one day I opened my eyes among ruins. I am the mother of Armenia, and this picture that you see there, with that I feel blood and tears each day and mixed in the waters of the nearby river. With this confession, the man can no longer maintain his composure and embraces the mother, giving his word that he will take her message to the son. It is only then that the reader finally finds out who the man is and why he is making his way to the son as he confesses to her that he too is Armenian, and it is with the pain of his people that he was making his way to the east. And toward the sun, Tilda Dinsey draws a bleak depiction of the army and national question. It is devoid of ideological flourish or a hopeful embrace of revolutionary empowerment. During a, quote, age abounded in dreamy visionaries and, and revolutionary ideologues, his approach is consistently that of a rigorous pragmatist who refused to be deflected from the current reality, end quote. This approach is evident in a singular interpretation of the story, for the specific tale of the soldier traveling to meet the sun has been told by various army authors, including Hovanes Tuman and Avadi Sahagyan, both based in the Russian Empire. Folklorist and children's author Hovanes Tuman adapted the idea for his version of the brainless man, while famed Armenian author Avadi Sahagyan penned his, uh, his own short story, Near the Sun, in 1905. The contrast with Sahagyan's version is especially noteworthy, where a destitute orphan, likely a standard for the Armenian people, journeys to the sun in order to find solutions to this problem. On um, route, he meets a kind shepherd who takes him in, provides him food, shelter, and a loving family. The orphan is brought to tears from relation and realizes that although he did not reach the sun, the sun is there, cradling him in that room. Thus, according to Sahagyan's version, though the situation of the Armenian people is dire, the sun will shine yet again. Till Gadinsi offers no such respite. Ruben Zakanya's uh, story titled Lord Hiras transports us to an orphanage in Mezine, a town where Zakanya himself spent time working as a teacher. 
Each paragraph of the sto short story paints a dreary depiction of the pitiful lives of the orphan, orphans, whose Zatanna refers to as the symbol of their racist crucifixion. He continues, Every night the trembling lips of the orphans cry to heaven above. Still, they search for an unfamiliar power which does not reveal itself. Each paragraph asks the depiction of the mournful state of the orphans and ends with the same three words, the invocation of the abandoned children, Lord, hear us. Over and over, we hear the children cry, Lord, hear us. These three words reverberate in the reader's mind, and yet the orphans never receive the response. Then the story shifts. So each paragraph ends with the three words plea to, the God, to God from the orphans. Satanian adds, Lord, listen especially to the girls, for the sons of vengeance, which the girls will nourish tomorrow, will search for responsibility. They will search and demand accountability for their mother's torment, and that tomorrow will be the most boring, frightful, because today's supplicant orphan girls, dragon-born cubs, will drink the enemy's blood by the handful, and easily drunk from that blood will dance at the doors of your temples. And waving their mother's shirts in the air, they will cry, Lord, hear us. We will restore justice still. In his conclusion, Zatayda does not petition the Lord for aid. He instead tells the Lord of his bloody condition. Though the publication date is unknown, certain estimations can be made regarding chronology. As noted above, the story centers around an orphanage in the small town of Mesidet. The German orphanage was opened in Mesidet in 1895. Between 94 and 97 took place a series of state-sanctioned massacres of Armenians in the eastern provinces. The attempts of the revolutionary parties to crystallize a sense of nationalism among the Armenians, as well as their public demonstrations, were viewed with suspicion by the state and allowing and allowed for a debilitating cycle oscillating between acts of rebellion by the revolutionary parties and demonstrations of power and oppression by the state, often leaving the average provincial Armenian in the crossfire. The increase in revolutionary activity coupled with an increase in state-sanctioned oppression marked a turning point in the breadth and scale of atrocities committed. Protestant missionary records indicate that almost 30,000 Armenians were killed in Kofet during the massacres in the 1890s, with upwards of an additional 10,000 dying as a result of hunger and exposure. Kofet was one of the regions most hardly hit by the massacres. However, in the nearby town of Mezidia, the setting from Zakhtar and Lord Hiras was left mostly unscathed, leading to a massive influx of widows and orphans from neighboring regions of the town. In order to accommodate the destitute arrivals, a German mission and orphanage were founded in Mezidia in 1895. Thus, it can be surmised that the wretched orphans who will go on to nurse dragon-born sons of tomorrow and Zakhtar and short story were those who were orphaned during the massacres and who came and were brought to the missionary in Mezidia. As for the special emphasis on the grief of the female orphans as impetus for creating tomorrow's generation of warriors, statistics gathered for Hockmet in 73 surrounding villages reported 2,300 instances of rape and 166 forced marriages of Armenian girls and women to Turks. Though many of the reported accounts of gender violence, of, of gender violence consisted of rape and forced conversion, the assault often extended beyond that to include also forced public nudity and other humiliating demonstrations of power. It is likely that many of the girls in Zakhadet's orphanage would have either been victims or witness of, witnesses of some sort of gender violence. Having better understood the context of the story, we can dissect the story's refrain and what the implication of the switch from Lord Hear Us to Lord Hear Us, We Will Restore Justice still has in our discussion of nationalism. Unlike his mentor, Tilda Dinsi, Zakhtar was sympathetic to the revolutionary movement. This engagement with revolutionary ideology and its rejection of pre prevalent Armenian apostolic doctrine frames the refrain of Zakhtar and Lord Hear Us. One of the dominant beliefs in Armenian apostolic discourse was subservience to God's will. In his work on the Armenian Revolutionary Movement, Gerard de Barida notes clergymen who informed their restless flock that Muslim, i.e. Turkish and Persian rule, had been dominant since the beginning of time, preached the virtues of timidity and the rewards of fatalism. This submission is reflected in the children who fret and frame or hear us. The orphans, like Tilda protagonists and towards the son, did what they had been inculcated to do, beseech their lord to hear their pleas. But Zakharan defies the submissiveness by conjuring up a new generation, emerging from the pains of its victimized mothers, refused to follow the same path of servility. These cubs no longer ask meekly for the Lord to hear them, but roar that they are seeking their own retribution. Zakharan's story echoes the ideological liberation of the contemporary revolutionary movement, the champion is self-reliance. Though this was not an entirely new ideology, the number of acolytes of this novel belief system was growing. Already in 1861, in Cleric and Leader in the Kitchening on Periodical Eagle of Vasquez, an article notes, who has decided for the army the people that they must suffer eternally in this dungeon of ignorance or hell? Is Christ's able hand going to come back down to earth and free them, perhaps? 
This rejection of the acceptance of the status quo was slowly permeating elsewhere throughout the Armenian millennium as well. In an article written in 1872, prominent Armenian journalist Rigo Anzumani writes, Yesterday we were an ecclesiastical community. Today we are patriots. This shift is evident in Zakhaidan's story. He's suggesting to replace the girl's religious ideology with the new nationalist ideology. The distinct approaches to confronting the national question presented by Tilda Dinsi and Zad Kadyan, two men who were born in the same region far from the capital, capital demonstrates diverse perceptions and methods regarding nationalism and ameliorating the plight of the provincial army to the eastern borderlands. In essence, in these two pieces, we see three approaches. First, the traditional religious response advocating for reliance on the divine power. Second, Zatarian's response imbued with contemporary ideals of human agency through self-reliance and an end to self-inflicted docility. And third, Tilgenitsi's measured alternative to Zatarian's more bombastic conception of human agency. The development and spread of nationalism was not a uniform process, nor was its inception in the Armenian populated villages and towns. Moreover, the difference exhibited between the two authors demonstrates that the intellectual discourse outside the center of the Ottoman Empire was not monolithic. On the contrary, there was variation. In examining these short stories from Armenian authors who hailed from outside the center of the empire and who focused on matters concerning life outside that center, we can glean important information, information which is inaccessible from a discussion of the center alone through a medium germane to the region and its producers. Armenians of the borderland did not blindly assimilate new ideologies, but instead grappled with contemporary discourse resulting in various degrees of rejection, acceptance, and even intervention, ultimately evincing more nuanced and complex depiction of the provinces and the intellectual development there. Thank you.
several um, um, hidden so-called Armenian uh, press. Um, um, Hamoradi Mamun, published by um, uh, revolutionary parties, which were very active back then in, in, in provinces. And uh, the most active were, um, of course, um, ARF, Darshna uh, Kutun. Um, so I've, uh, I chose uh, several Hamoradi um, uh, periodicals that started to, to be published and legally to be published uh, after um, uh, 1908 revolution. And we have um, records about these periodicals, uh, both from Arshak al famous um, um, article about uh, the history of Armenian press, but also unpublished um, work of Aram Andonian, the history of Armenian press when he um, um, uh, gives all the names of uh, uh, Hammurabi press and uh, he gives the details of what the content was this uh, press was uh, published in, in, in Armenian provinces uh, since um, 1908. Um, so um, today um, I want, uh, so these uh, periodicals, uh, these uh, color types are called uh, press, um, was um, of course uh, lost, most of this was lost during the Armenian genocide, but uh, the biggest collection now preserved in the uh, in Vienna in the um, uh, Armenian congregation archives. But you can find also this uh, here and there in different archives, including in Armenia and including here in Boston in Armenia. Um, Revolutionary Federation archives, so you can find these periodicals also all around the world, like in every Armenian um, archive um, where you go. And um, so uh, the uh, these periodic the periodicals, if you look at the content of these periodicals, um, you see how um, uh, the um, center um, Istanbul. Uh, Kostanopolis um, uh, influenced this Hammurabi uh, press in in, uh, in, uh, in provinces, um, but um, the important thing is uh, that um, this was also for provincial Armenians to um, not only to copy but the discourses that were going on in, 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 in the centers and in Izmir. Istanbul, but also to uh, raise their own voices and to become a part of these larger discourses that were going on in, in Ottoman Armenian life um, back then. And um, so, uh, and the, uh, and my focus was to see how uh, the questions of Armenian women emancipation, the movement, the, 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 the gender issues were discussed um, in the provinces itself. So we have, um, we know a lot, uh, thanks to Lerna, uh, Hasmik, and Melissa, we know a lot about um, um, Armenian women movement in Istanbul, in the center, what was happening, and we know how these women were trying to bring uh, this to, to the provinces. But um, um, actually, this, uh, this Hammurabi Armenian press from provinces shows how uh, women Provincial Armenian women were trying to be part of this discourse and trying to um, reflect on that and be, uh, become an active uh, participants of this um, change that they were hoping to gain um, from this um, movement or um, uh, this women emancipation. Uh, so um, and. Um, uh, I, I forgot to mention that uh, after the revolution, uh, so Armenian, provincial Armenians didn't wait uh, for uh, the normal press to come. Uh, they have started to use this technology, um, the new technology that um, uh, was cheaper for them and more, but they could um, uh, kind of uh, use it to quickly to uh, um, uh, publish this press, so they, that's why you can see in provincial in, in provinces a lot much more uh, Hammurabi press than the usual um, 
uh, the usual press. Um, and um, so I have uh, mentioned, um, um, so uh, yes, um, many Armenian uh, newspapers in the late 19th century and in the beginning of the 20th century started to raise the questions of women and many of them had um, this Anans um, Bashin or uh, the, the, um, where they were discussing the, these questions regarding women and their issues and this um, tradition came to uh, prompt the Armenian press and um, as you can see here, uh, so uh, you see Genochaka Ejer, this, uh, this was published in the Gran in after 1908 and um, this was the place when um, um, provincial Armenian women were publishing their ideas about um, uh, women's um, rights and uh, what should be done, how, it should, how this change should, uh, changes should come. Um, so, um, but the, the most important part of, uh, of this uh, research actually, for me at least, was to discover uh, ARF, uh, ARF's approach to these questions. Uh, Armenian Revolutionary Party was very active in the provinces, they became very influential, so they were the first to publish Hammurabi Press hidden before 1908, and after that, they became even very active. And so, what they were doing, they were um, they were very progressive, and they were raising the questions of uh, the, uh, the the women's emancipation. How um, should uh, these reforms come, and what should be done uh, to to make um, uh, this um, um, happening? And also, uh, how they were. Um, trying to convince Gavaratsi Armenians that um, without women's emancipation you cannot see uh, our nation uh, to, to a good place, we, you cannot see uh, uh, reforms if we are not um, um, going to start with uh, women and their education and uh, um, uh, the, uh, their emancipation. And um, uh, some of their texts actually very much reminded me of uh, the uh, text of socialist feminists uh, who would say that we have to um, change the social order in, uh, in province um, to be able to, um, to build new uh, and equal society where women, men and women will equally um, be, will be con contributing for the future of Armenia and for the future of Armenian Hagagangavar, um, um, Armenian Gavar. Um, um, so, and um, um, I lost my text. But uh, what uh, kind of questions? So, uh, mostly were discussed in this Hamurabi Armenian press. First, um, uh, the question of forced marriage was. Uh, one of the main topic uh, topics discussed for the marriage existing among <coughs> Armenians when Armenian women didn't have a right to choose their own um, husband that was the issue and um, already we see when we read these articles reflecting this question we see how um, Armenians um, reading Western uh, literature knowing about um, marriage of love they were trying to convince their community that if we will marry for love, this will um, um, be the right thing and this will create a happy um, community and we will avoid all these um, uh, tragedies that uh, Armenian married couples were facing um, as a result of these forced marriages. And we see this really interesting conflict um, between ARF and Armenian Church, who was uh, the the main um, um, so the Armenian marriages in general uh, were legalized by the Armenian Church. So Armenian Church was playing uh, an important role in this, legalizing these forced marriages. So and um, ARF was criticizing them and 
and it was happening through this um, uh, school press. And if you see in this text how um, young students were raising their, vo their voices and trying to convince their um, 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 parents to change this and uh, to, um, um, to do uh, things differently. And so, um, and uh, the, the, the other question that was discussed, uh, the, the role of Armenian women, women in, in, um, and her place uh, in uh, decision-making processes. Uh, so, um, uh, the ARF members believe that um, women should have voice, women should have their input uh, to, uh, to, to decisions that were made on behalf of them. Uh, they cannot um, be ignored, and um, in, in the pages of uh, this uh, area of uh, uh, school newspapers, I've read many stories uh, and um, articles about the local um, 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 you know, um, criticism about what was happening and how traditional Armenian communities in these areas were um, uh, suppressing women voices and for not allowing them to um, somehow to participate in this uh, um, in these processes. Um, um, as you know, uh, uh, Armenian um, uh, actresses were very famous in the Ottoman Empire. It started in the mid 19th century, and they were coming. They were playing um, in um, also in. In the provinces, uh, performing in the provinces, but um, there was a um, resistance to allow local Armenian girls from uh, local schools to participate in this place, and to um, so this was also largely criticized by criticized by um, um, ARF young ARF uh, both male and female um, 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 this. Uh, writers who were publishing in this Hammurabi press saying that we have to fight it and the, the, uh, uh, the stage is both for men and for women and we have to um, support those women who want to play in this uh, in, in a theater and it's, um, it, is a, it is good for us uh, to, um, to have them and also, uh, but also the content of uh, this place was important and it was discussed in this press. So, uh, for example, Shirvanzadeh's um, um, the, the play was um, discussing that, oh, it, it raises the question of unequal marriages and the question of Armenian, um, we, how these women were suffering in forced marriages and how the education is in Important and this place is important for community to reflect on what's happening in um, our community to see the, um, the gaps and uh, the work that we have to do. So, um, and, um, so yes, this was also the part of uh, the narrative convincing their community to, um, uh, to support these women who wanted to um, participate in this um, place. Um, we see that um, um, mostly both male and female um, students were participating, writing um, articles for these uh, newspapers. And, um, but um, um, there is a, there, there there were also these homoerotic press, which were mostly initiated and published by women, and. Um, uh, I want to present uh, one of them. Um, so it's uh, uh, Anna from Sivri uh, Hisad. I don't have it in my slides, I guess not. Um, um, but you can see the first, I mean, you can see here uh, Anna Hit's first uh, issue. So um, Sivri Hisar, um, no, Sivri Hisar uh, is in, in, the, in, the, uh, in the center of Anatolia. Uh, Ankara, yeah, yeah, and uh, Ankara province. So, um, and the Armenian community there um, were both conservative but also very progressive. They 
I had this. Um, um, oh, they had bundles who were going working in um, big cities, coming back. But um, if we read uh, the uh, the position of Armenian women in in uh, civil society in mid 19th centuries, we see that. Um, uh, they had to. Uh, they had to have a munch, which they, which meant that they couldn't speak um, uh, with the family members of, until they had their third child. They couldn't go out, um, um, and uh, and so on and so forth. All these, you know, traditions and uh, how traditional. Um, this uh, family structure worked in city side, uh, but um, in uh, in 1912, when Anahit was published, we see how um, uh, city side women were trying to um, change uh, this, were trying to support um, uh, this uh, local city side Armenian women to. Um, uh, to find their place, to take their higher place in a society and contribute to rebuilding um, um, their community. And um, we see again what kind of questions they were raising. They were raising the questions of Armenian women not um, having the equal um, um, access for the education. They were complaining that Again, uh, uh, after being married, they were kept like as they, they are in a harem, and they were saying that without us, without women, without our contribution, um, um, we cannot build a bright future for uh, for Gabar and for um, uh, Armenian uh, women. But um, they were also uh, they were also. Um, um, Having this um, um, uh, criticism from the locals, saying that oh you are exaggerating, this is not true. You have your place. You have a we have Rivsimi and You have uh, you have your place. You are participating in a mix, you know this event. You, you we are doing these readings together. But you have your place in a society, and this is exaggeration. What you are writing. Um, um, in these uh, um, in Anahit pages, and interestingly, the, the, the chief editor of Anahit responds to them saying that those of you who cannot acknowledge your mistakes, you are damaging the future of the nation, which is very true about today's, you know, the Armenians do not like criticism <laughs> in general, so that was the, uh, the case in CPD Sarvan. When we were complaining about this, and um, so um, and this is, oh, I mean, I have a lot uh, to say, but um, uh, women were trying to, as I said, we were trying to become a part. Provincial Armenian women were trying to be, become a part of this uh, movement, uh, which started from. Um, Istanbul, and uh, which was, uh, it was also in the beginning, in the, from the very beginning, for them to, um, you know, to give them access for education, for because um, uh, Armenian families would say that they need an education, they need to emancipate Armenian women in provinces. This is important, and we see how provincial Armenians themselves, these women themselves. Um, uh, try to find a solution, try, try to uh, raise their voices, saying that yes, this is our community, this is our situation, and try to find a um, solutions to to solve this and to really be emancipated and become a part of this um, um, reconstruction, let's say, of Armenian provincial Armenians in the beginning of 20th century. So, um, yeah, I think I don't have time, but uh, yeah, in the Q&A session, I can uh, answer to your questions. Thank you.
Okay, can you all hear me well? Okay, I know I'm the last speaker, so I'll try to keep it short. Again, thank you for the invitation and thanks for the organizers. So this is a, a work in progress, a project my colleague Emma John Dado, who and I have been working on for some time, and this is the first time we're actually presenting the results of this research. So this uh, project concerns the memoirs of a very unknown figure, Boris Shadigian. This man you see in the picture here. Unfortunately, we do not have his pictures from a younger age. And it's a memoir that was actually unpublished, that is still unpublished. And this is a glimpse of the memoir itself. And to give you a biographical overview of who this man was, so Lois Shadigian was born into a middle-class Catholic family in Ottoman Rabizon in 1874. He was educated in Trabzon first and then went to Venice uh, to get uh, further education in the Bukhtarist monastery on the island of San Lazarus. So sometimes in the 1890s he joined the Armenian Revolutionary Federation, but we don't clearly know at which date and he doesn't talk much about how he joined the movement. So, to give you an overview of what he did as an ARF militant, he was deployed in France, Lebanon, Bulgaria, Tiflis, Alexandropol, Gimli, Baku, and many parts of the Ottoman Eastern Provinces. And as I'll talk uh, more in a minute, he was the deputy commander of the largest ARF weapon smuggling group in 1898, and I'll talk more about this expedition or campaign in the last few slides. And finally, he migrated to the United States, uh, to New York in 1907, and we have the records of his migra uh, migration records, basically. So to give you a visual of where this man was actually deployed and how he was just moving around, you see from Trabzon, uh, or Trabzon to Venice, and then to Northern Caucasus, part of Russia, back to Europe, all the way to Lebanon, and then in Tiflis and Baku and Eastern. Ottoman provinces. So what we can say is Vol Shadigan, to use uh, Uri Berberian's recent uh, book title, Roving Revolutionaries. So he was this perfect roving revolutionary whose journey actually gives us a case study of what historians would nowadays call a global microhistory. So we can really understand what was happening in the late and in the late 19th, early 20th centuries by looking at the trajectory and footsteps of Paul Shadigian. So the regional and the global transformations that we encounter in his memoirs are, for example, the railway road, uh, the, stream, the streamlines, telegraph lines, uh, passport control. So these are all modern kind of creations and technologies in the 19th and the early 20th century. But most importantly for our purposes, it actually gives us a more subaltern story of what the Armenian revolutionaries looked like. And we can really shift away from this very mythical and sometimes idealized history of the Armenian revolutionary movement. So we can understand the more quote unquote profane, human, and mundane aspects of revolutionaries. And that's how we can really rescue the kind of muted or the silenced voices of people who did not really um, leave us any account or whose name are not really mentioned in mainstream historiographical uh, chronicles. So there is a rich literature on the Armenian Revolutionary Movement. Of course, this is not the first project, it hopefully won't be the last project, but there is a dominance of political and intellectual histories. Most works on the Armenian Revolutionary Movement focus on the political and the ideologies of the movement, the revolutionary founders, the party intelligentsia, probably for understandable uh, reasons. So although we have a lot of memoirs written by veteran revolutionaries, uh, there is very little scholarly work on these, on these average militants who were deployed on the ground. So even though, let's say, Turkish and Arab memoirs have been deconstructed and used for scholarly purposes, we cannot really say the same for Armenian memoirs. And Emre Can and I believe this is the case because, among other factors, cultural and social history have not made inroads into mainstream Armenian historiography. It's mostly political and intellectual historiography that we have. So this is basically a selective list of memoirs written by former revolutionaries. I won't go into the detail, but just to give you an idea that we have an abundance of 
memoir is written by these ex Hunchakian ARF or Rangabar members, or even Arminagar members. So when we read the different chapters in the memoirs, and I will explain how we actually divided the chapters in the next few slides, we get a sense or a clear sense of how Armenian revolutionaries use the paraphernalia of a state and the religious symbolism of the Armenian ch church actually to make a claim to communal and imperial politics. For example, they use the means of violence, revolutionary taxes, tribunals, new press, and the religious symbolism of the church, such as the sword courts, the saint kind of cause, the kind of um, calling uh, the killed militants as martyrs. So this is all religious symbolism that we clearly see in the memoirs. So what, what we are arguing here is that a social analysis of revolutionary committees should complement explanations heavily biased towards ideologies, whether it's nationalism or any kind of, or socialism or any uh, other kind of ideology. We need a social history of these revolutionary committees. So in this sense, the memoirs we have at hand is a contribution to history from below, an understanding of how these people were operating in the ground or on the ground. So in a way, we can really localize these people in their immediate environment, whether it's in the Russian, Iran, or Ottoman empires. So in this sense, Shadikian, Bo Shadikian, or as he's known, Bo Shadik, was an RF middleman. And by middleman, we understand that he was not in the party elite and not at the top level, nor was he someone very unimportant. So he had connections between the elite and the kind of the very local peasants and the revolutionaries on the ground. And he was this intermediary between the upper echelons of the party and the lower echelons. So once we get to the different chapters of, of these memoirs, we get a more detailed pictures, as I said, of the revolutionaries' micro stories, what each and every indiv individual went through or why he or she went to these very uh, different processes that we are talking about. So it is, we believe it is only through such a methodology that we can come up with new questions for old problems, such as why were these people recruited, how were they mobilized, how did they interact with their immediate socio-economic environment, and what was really the moving force behind their mobilization. And once we have this, uh, this picture clearer in our minds, we can really find divisions, cleavages, fault lines among these revolutionary parties, because we need to understand that these revolutionary parties, even if in our historiography are depicted as these monolithic social political forces, they have major cleavages and divisions among themselves. And once we start looking at history from below, we can really understand these fault lines and we can get a more complex uh, portrayal of these social and political actors. So what, is the general, what are some of the general characteristics of Bolos Shadigian's narrative? This is not an account of glory, it's not an account of success, nor an account of pride. It's a story of devotion, and yet of disappointment, failure, and disillusionment. So he has a lot of uh, instances where he tries to do something, he, he fails, and then he's disappointed by the ARF Supreme uh, leaders. So there's much um, details on that. So he has a strong emphasis on the difficulties and the personal sacrifices that he did or he went through. So when we understand the post-genocidal context in which these memoirs were written, so these memoirs were written probably in the 19. 30s, 40s, we don't know, we don't have an exact date, we get an understanding that this was a self-fashioning of Armenian fedais or veteran uh, members of these revolutionary committees as the new superman or uberman and as a source of emulation for future generation. Again, this is, a, this is in a post-genocidal context where these revolutionaries are trying to create their own leg legitimacy as a pre-genocidal political and social actor. So one very interesting characteristic that we can actually uh, talk more about is how Boz Shadigan is vividly portraying the tensions between Caucasian and 
Ottoman Armenians. And this is not something that is really discussed in the historiography of Armenian revolutionary movements because we tend to think that Caucasians and Ottomans had both the same expectations and encountered the same reality. And this is very clearly evident that that was not the case in Shadigan's memoir. And he himself had these different conflicts and tensions with Caucasian Armenians. So once we localize Shadigan in the major events of the period, such as the Hamidian massacres in 1894, 95, 96, the Burian insurgency in 1903-1904 in northern Georgia, and the Russian Revolution 1905. So these are some of the major events that Chadigyan really uh, describes and he takes part in. We get a more, uh, I, I would say, a tangible understanding of the trans-regional and the, the trans-sectarian nature of these revolutionary parties. And I guess this is a point that my colleague and I would like to stress on that we all know that the, these revolutionary committees operated in different, let's say, localities and different empires, but once we follow the footsteps of, of one man who's really roving around, we get a sense of how these committees were first trans-regional, so they were not really focused on one area, and trans-sectarian. Remember, Shadigyan was born into a Catholic family, and he describes, let's say, revolutionary committees who that included people from the Protestant community as well as from the uh, apostolic community. So this was a, a novelty that these revolutionary committees brought into the Armenian community by going beyond these sectarian divides and just connecting people that were not really connected uh, before. So the manuscript, as we, as we got it, does not really follow a consistent chronology. It was just written in five different notebooks. So we had to actually divide the, the narrative into different chapters, into different episodes. So we basically came up with 10 different chapters from the late 1880s until his uh, departure for the United States. And before I conclude, I'd just like to focus on the sixth chapter, which is the longest chapter in the memoir. And basically that's the Battle of Khastur and how Boaz Shadigan himself, the deputy commander of this weapon smuggling, the largest weapon smuggling ARF group, actually crossed the border from the Russian Empire into the Ottoman territories. And a few hours after they crossed into Ottoman lands, they were actually um, intercepted by Kurdish irregulars and Ottoman troops, and there's a large skirmish that takes place, and the kind of group actually is forced to withdraw. So this is uh, the, the exact look at, okay. oh, you can't see up you can't see the pointer. So if you see number seven up there, there's a small kind of spark. That's where the Battle of Khastur actually takes place between, uh, on the border of the Russian and the Ottoman Empire. And the reason why the Battle of Khastur is important, and this is really a major account that we, had, we didn't have before, is after the fiasco of, of, of this weapon smuggling team, the ARF, the ARF changes its, its kind of policy. So instead of sending large groups of, of weapon smuggling teams, they start actually operating with, with smaller teams. So this was a very major turning point in how the ARF is actually thinking about sending weapons and arms to different uh, provinces in the Ottoman Empire. So just a few re reflections on the memoirs uh, itself. Again, as I said, it's a social history, or we try to understand it from the perspective of a social historian, and we believe that it provides us some alternative histories on the Armenian Revolutionary Movement. So memoirs themselves are important, quote-unquote, ego, ego documents that we can really critically use to have a more um, uh, clear understanding of some of the provincial dynamics that Anna and Nora were actually talking about as well, and it would open new avenues of research in the, in the future. And finally, we believe that through the usage of such memoirs, through the critical usage of such means of communication, technologies of communication, to kind of related to the theme of the conference, we can arrive at more, or we can arrive at a more complicated and multi-layered multi view of the Armenian Revolution.
I'm sorry. All good? Yeah. Wrong? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Thank you, um, organizers, presenters. Uh, I know it's a difficult time for all of us to focus and, um, in general, like take our minds to somewhere else than what is going on on the ground right now. So I really appreciate that we pulled it all together and managed to bring it to the end, almost uh, to the end. Um, I, my comments will be based on what I read, mostly, okay? because I was anticipating that I was not going to be able to fully participate in real time. I read the papers, the three papers, uh, closely, so comments are based on that, um, even though I'll be also engaging with some of the things that said here. Okay, first of all, the panel papers work well together. Like, this is a good panel. I, <laughs> In, I, I see. Okay, so it wasn't randomly put together. Great. Um, even though, this is, this is the case, even though they are at different stages of their life cycle. So from conception to publication, there's a different level, or like there's, it's, it's their different stages of gestation, let's say. They all revolve around the theme of how to access the lives of provincial Ottoman Armenians during the late 19th and early 20th centuries. This is especially a daunting task, as has been mentioned, given the near complete elimination of Armenian life, institutions, archive, archives during the genocide. The three papers approach the question through three different types of primary sources. Nora uses literary output, Barak uses memoir, and Anna uses contemporary newspapers, the Khamaradif Press. Thematically, the papers revolve around ARF, which really seems to have gained real popularity among the provinces at this time. But more broadly, the papers inquire the heterogeneous responses to the emerging revolutionary movements and ideologies, nationalist and to a certain extent socialist. All three presenters are interested in the voices from below, so to speak, the non-elite folks, young students, women, average revolutionary, average partisan, or middle layer intelligentsia or intelligentsia to be. The common scholarly goal here is to understand the evolving worldviews of provincial Armenians with regards to their tormented but modernizing nation and their perspective on how to reform it. The papers engage with the current historiography in varying degrees, and I will now offer my brief comments on each one of them in the context of the historiographies that they speak to individually and all together. So, Anna, and it's, there's no real particular order. I guess it's just chronological problem how I saved it in, the file, in my computer. Alexanya's paper contains extremely interesting relatively unknown data, the Khamoradip youth press of the provinces and the way they discussed women's issues, specifically the IRF ones. Uh, she didn't bring it in during the presentation, but the paper, as I hope all of us read, is really uh, populated with quotations from the primary sources themselves. Um, so it does a very good job, as you read it, in transferring us uh, to a school in one in 1908, where Shirvan Zadeh is staged, staged with participation of young students from the girls' school as actresses, or to the uh, Salnabad orphanage, where girls invite ARF to their institution for a general discussion, and the alarmed board of trustees 
accuse them of prostitution. This is something that she didn't bring up, but it's very interesting that uh, they, call, they would dare to make the analogy of the school inviting these uh, revolutionaries turning into a brothel because of it. Or we are in Sivrihisar in 1912, where the Anahit Journal declared that their goal that their goal, this Anahi Journal's main goal, is fighting the family rot and the harem situation. End of quote. So it is nothing short of mind-boggling to learn about these cases in and of themselves. This is especially because our view of the Armenian women's movement has thus far been formed via studies of newspapers and books published in Istanbul and a few other uh, metropoles. As I am one of those, as mentioned by Anna, I am one of those people who produced it. Hasmi Kalapian is one of, out of the very few other people. So literally, we don't know what happened, how these topics were discussed in the provinces. So it is a significant uh, new step in this in this in this literature. So we welcome Anna's intervention with open arms. And even this short and still raw paper already advances the literature by uh, how ideas such as women's rights to cho cho choosing their own spouse instead of finding themselves in arranged marriages were not debating only among both high or Tiflitsa high elites in the respective empires, but also in the corridors and dorms of girls' schools and orphanages in the provinces. But I already mentioned this is still a raw paper, obviously. I wish, I really wish to see this article, I mean, as a standalone, in this piece, as a standalone uh, published article. For that, the author needs to have a discussion of the historiography, tell us what has been missing, and more critically, what she brings new to it that is different from bringing just more data to it but in terms of also producing more knowledge about how the reforming Armenian nation of the 19th century connected gender order to their advancement, safety, and even liberation. In other words, Anna brings the ingredients of a great meal to me. I, I don't know why I wrote this. I, I just read it. I was probably cooking on this side too. This three days ago, I wrote, Anna brings to the, to the table the ingredients of a great meal to be and now she needs to cook the meal. That is the analytical word, and she also needs to serve it well, and she can do it if she pushes for it. The current paper gives us a quick taste of the future meal, and I quote from her, these passages from Anahit shows how provincial women saw their movement for emancipation as a part of reforms needed to improve nation's position because they believed that only educated and free women could provide the nation with conscious mothers who would raise a new generation. You can take this and play with it in various ways. You can connect it to Middle East, Middle East women and gender uh, historiography, East European historiography, Armenian, uh, other parts of the Armenian Empire, what's happening, I mean, maybe Russian Empire, not just East, Ottoman East. And I encourage you to do that, Anna. So I move to the other papers. Barak's and Nora's papers are more explicit about their historiographical interventions. So Barak Ketamanyan targets the ARF scholarship, both popular and academic, that tend to focus on the leadership of the movement and project an idealized image. What he brings to the table is a low-level revolutionary, Ol Shadikyan, who never occupied a very high level leadership position in the ARF, but whose narrative productively complicates our understanding of how the nationalist revolutionary ideology sprang among the masses in the provinces, and not from like top down, but also from below, various, in a mundane way, how he found himself uh, to be part of this moment and the, and the way that he worked in it. More, most importantly, we understand that for many who participated to the ARF, it might not have been high ideals of nationalism and role. Travis on board Shadikyan is from a province, yes, but he travels all around the empires, different empires and the Balkans. He's involved in the same groups with Armenians from other parts of the Ottoman Empire and from those of Russia, gives us a precious sense of how these trans-regional, trans-sectarian connections were maintained and negotiated. This is because 
because Shadikyan narrative pays attention to the daily life, financial concerns, and social and familial relations. For example, it, it, as it is discussed in his paper, uh, Barak's paper, Shadik's altercation with Simon Zavarian, physical altercation, allows us to refine our portrayal of the party, even though it might be less than ideal. I only wish there were more concrete examples like that in the paper. But this is not a shortcoming as such, because the whole memoir itself is the primary source here. Uh, there is no need for bringing up quotations to pre-prove the point because I think this is a polished introduction to what will become the published memoir, translated and published memoir. So I would like Varak today to discuss a little bit more and ideally in the, if it ends up being part of, at least the main part of the introduction, uh, the conditions around the production of this memoir in the first place. It is, I understand, we understand that it's written in the US after the genocide, but when do we know when it was written, for whom it was written, was it meant to be published, was it dictated to someone, a child, sometimes a grandchild, and uh, how did Warak and Emre Jan found the, the uh, the memoir and how did the owners of the memoir trusted them with the translation, who translated it, how did you trust the translator, and um, other than the ARF, pre ARF literature or the Armenian historiography, maybe what other subfields in the general genre of like Ottoman historiography you would like this uh, memoir to speak to. So last but not least, Nora's paper. She's here with me, right? Yes. She is. Yes. Okay. So it's always great to see uh, fictional accounts used for historical research. Uh, they do or can improve our understanding of the political subjectivities of our historical actors. Nora is interested in the differing responses of provincial masses to the emerging or ongoing nationalist revolutionary movement around them. She argues that these responses were not monolithic. To make this point, she compares two short stories written by two provincial intellectuals, the Tilgundatsi of Harpert, who wrote a piece in 1911, and one written by his protege, Rupen Zartanian, that deals with the aftermath of the Hamidian massacres. So while Tilgun Nazis viewed the revolutionary activities with more caution, thinking that they might bring worse days than good, Zartanian supposed, supported the rebellious activities of the revolutionaries and eventually became an ARF member. While Tilgun Nazis' story can be summarized with the words called Lord Hiras, Zartarian's summary was, quote, Lord, hear us, we will restore justice still. While I'm sympathetic to Nora's intentions here, I'm not 100% convinced that a short reading of two short stories allow us to make this big argument. This problem could be solved if Nora engaged with the secondary literature on the topic, which would offer plenty to boost her point. Indeed, a good chunk of Nora's paper is about the historiography, even though in the, verbal, uh, in the oral presentation, Nora didn't make a uh, huge point about the criticism of historiography, even though she did mention it. It's a, it's a significant part, portion of the paper, uh, in which Nora's main criticism is that the scholarly literature on the Ottoman Armenians privileged Constantinople at the expense of provinces. Uh, so while this might have been the case maybe like 20 years ago or even 15 years ago, it is not the case anymore. And I think like Nora quotes in the piece to make this point, Stepan Asturian's 1996 dissertation. And at the time I think Asturian was right but not anymore. A lot has changed. Modern historians who participate to this conference themselves produced great work in this subfield. 
uh, Dominar has a co-edited book specifically on the topic titled The Ottoman East in the 19th Century, in which scholars who do work on Ottoman Armenian East, such as Ali Sipahi, Ohannes Kılıçda, Tolga Çora, Mehmet Bulatal and Cihangir Gundot contribute to essays about provincial Armenians. Owen Miller is another name. Nora Lesterson is also a participant here. Uh, 2015 CSSH article pro is titled Provincial Cosmopolitanism and is making a point about the heterogeneous uh, responses. So, this body of literature already forwarded the idea that Armenians of the provinces did not blindly follow the contemporary discourses but assimilated them the way that made most sense to them and acted accordingly. In other words, Armenians in the periphery are, per are not peripheral anymore to the writing of Armenian uh, history. So I invite Nora to have a critical engagement with this literature, which has the potential of her discussion of Tilgandati and Zartanya only stronger, because if she might be bringing with these examples something really new to the table or a new type of a a uh, dimension to an already known uh, conclusion. I, last but not least, I would also like her to discuss um, what she means by borderland, because from what I understand, Nora is using province and borderland interchangeably, but not all provinces are borderland. One can study Ottoman Bursa or Adana as provinces, but to the way that I understand, they don't con to borderlands as such, and Harput is not one either. So, in any case, Nora's paper being also in the early stages of its gestation, I hope she finds the points that I raise here as constructive criticism, and I would like to hear her from about uh, these particular points, historiography and uh, the borderland question. With that, thank you all. Now, or should we wait for the others to respond and then you can take over? I can go. You can go? Yeah. Uh, all right, since you're online, I think I want to give uh, yeah. clues to you, so you can uh, start responding and then move forward. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for your detailed uh, uh, response. Um, you definitely, um, so I should say this is a very, um, this is a little bit hopefully the foundation of what will eventually be my dissertation. Um, so I know that there are a lot of gaps and a lot of things I need to work on. Um, as for your, your comment on province and borderland, that's still something that I'm trying to work out. Um, that, um, as well as what is a provincial writer, because as I mentioned, um, Zartarian is a provincial writer, but he's also not because he spent so much time in the center. So those are two things that I have to um, decide if I'm discussing only borderlands, or if I'm discussing provincial literature. Um, so those two things that I do have to um, kind of um, hone in on and decide completely when I do begin my uh, dissertation. Um, let's see. You, I, I completely understand what you said, that this isn't, um, uh, and that, that was, I guess, carelessness on my part. I shouldn't have written it in such a way that that is the case still now that the, the provinces aren't um, as discussed provincial history. Um, I should be more specific here you're right that um, it has been dealt with, and I, I should mention that Dr. Dendidian's edited volume on the on the per, on the on the borderlands as actually a big part of what I've been reading, um, and I've been using that for other versions of this paper, um, and I did discuss it as well. You're you're right um, in this paper, um, and I should maybe um, I guess I need to also um, be clearer that it's more the literature. Um, that has remained less studied, um, and I do uh, I do think that that um, is partly because 
it isn't, I, I don't know if I should say it isn't as rich, but it is harder to find things that correspond so well to the history um, because the conventions of the, you know, either the novel or the play or the short story weren't followed um, as clearly. Um, so it is a little bit more, to, you know, if you're, if you're studying Siamoto or if you're studying Otsumi, um, it's easier to find these pieces. And I think it's a little bit more difficult whether there's um, some dialectical issues. Um, you know, if you were to study a play by Tilda Vinci, it is difficult to even translate the, the, the play um, and to follow the, 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 the narrative because, because he wasn't as familiar with how to write a play, so it's a little, it's a little bit harder to pick apart. So I do think there are a couple of reasons why um, provincial literature hasn't been as explored um, as literature from the center. Um, I'm also interested in something that I barely touched upon in this paper, but I hope to eventually expand on, is the interplay between literature um, in the provinces and literature being produced in the Russian Empire. Um, I kind of discussed that a little bit with Fisakyan and um, Tumanyan, but I hope to eventually um, develop that also. So there's still a lot of things that I have to kind of um, decide, really. I have to decide whether I'm discussing more borderlands or whether I'm discussing provinces, and how much of that interplay between the two empires I want to explore. Um, and along with that will come the a deeper exploration of the historiography, of the secondary research that's already been done um, in order to, like you said, make my own arguments stronger and to enrich my own argument. Um, let's see. Um, those are my main, my main responses, but I really appreciate you um, reading the paper so closely and offering your, your, your thoughts on that. And those are the things that I will be working on um, again in the upcoming uh, months when I um, craft and further um, uh, revise this this paper that I'll be working on actually more so in the next few months. Thank you. Can I just add something? I mean, one, one thing. Yeah, but maybe you should come. Uh, come should I come? Can you hear Lena, Nara? Can you hear me from here? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Okay. I think what you said at the end, using like the investigating Ottoman provincial uh, Armenian literature in. For its engagement, I mean, the way that it was received by the Russian army figure it would be fascinating. I don't think that I mean I don't think there has been much work on this. But there is, I think, it's kind uh, of how of, how it was received by the by the Russian. How it was received and how it was like digested in a way. How they have, as you are showing it, the uh, the piece, but how um, Tomania used it, like if you could, it, I think the argument is mostly there, the way that I see it. That your most important uh -huh. contribution to the literary studies in the Armenian history, in the Armenian literature, in Armenian literary historiography, would be uh, looking at, and then in that case, the borderland argument would make sense. You're, so you're saying that you think the, the strongest route to take would be to discuss the interplay between the two empires and how pieces in, in these provinces were actually digested, interpreted, not necessarily interpreted, but discussed in the, in the Russian Empire. Discussed and adopted uh, by the Russian Armenians, from what I understand, in, in the centers, right? Maybe in the Russian Ottoman, Armen uh, Russian Armenian provinces as well, but like there is a there is a. Um, what is it? It's not even. Uh, 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 yeah. uh, what was produced in, in Russian Empire by Russian Armenians, it was coming to, to uh, in my understanding, it was coming to the first. I mean, provincial Armenians were reading this literature. They were reading Shivan Zadeh, they were reading Rafi, and they were kind of in an exchange of ideas. You yeah. see the dialogue. Even in a lot of different threads, yeah, you yeah. see that they are in a dialogue with this. And also, revolutionaries who came from the Russian Empire, right? So they were bringing this literature, it was a hidden, uh, kind of, they were hiding this literature. But at the same time, it was a dialogue, right? May I add something? Yes. Yeah. Definitely, you know, most of the Russian literature that dealt with the uh, with Western Armenia, with the oppression, mm -hmm. etc., was specifically targeting. Uh, the Ottoman Armenians, to that extent. So 
So a lot of most of the, this literature played a dominant role in reigniting or igniting the national or culture feeling of the Ottoman Armenians towards that, That's very important, the Russian aspect of the Can you hear us, uh, um, it's a little, it's a little yeah. 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 yeah, so basically, well, definitely the Russian Armenians were producing literature of various kinds and it was being received by the Ottoman Armenians, especially in the provinces. I mean, the, as in Anna showed, like Shirvan Vadis play was being staged in 1909 in Sibiris, or no, in Ma, yeah. which makes more you know, sense in the borderland, yeah. yeah. But so then, we, this is kind of more known, I think, than how uh, Ottoman Armenian provincial literature, fictional literature, is being adopted by Russian Armenians in the center that is Tiflis. Yeah. I see. Uh, I, since we, uh, I think before going into a discussion, I want to let Anna and Barak uh, respond first and then uh, go into the discussion. I just want to thank Lerna for bringing like the um, layers of my um, paper that I usually, I don't know how to present my papers, I always keep the most important part of it. And uh, I really appreciate your comments and yes, I'm going to cook this because it is important and the provincial army and women voices should be heard because this where people who were massacred during the Armenian genocide. It is really important to understand who were there before the deportation. And because it is very much connected how they were responding to genocidal crimes, right? So how they were um, responding to these crimes and how they were trying to really um, become a decision makers and save uh, the nation from this um, uh, tragedy. So this, um, so this, that's why I found this very important. Um, yeah. It's like they are already trained to, yes. claim, to have a claim. Yes, and, <coughs> yes. and also uh, we should uh, not forget uh, 1819 massacres, the environment of violence that uh, most of them survived. They were survivors of this violence and it was they saw an opportunity to uh, kind of find their places uh, in this short period of six years and then it helped them during the genocide because they became decision makers they forced to become decision makers with the genocide and that was the key for their survival if not they they were not this passive you know uh, you don't have to hear what you can do. Yeah, this is... The other, they both work. Just bring it a little closer to you and all will be loved. That was great. Hey, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. So, uh, again, thank you very much for the comments and the questions. So, there are three basic of questions here. The conditions of the production of the manuscript, well, I should say that we don't know much about the manuscript. I mean, the, the liaison between us and the family is Emre John, so he knows more about the family, family history. But I'm assuming this was kind of dumped in an attic or, I don't know, because uh, the, the family doesn't doesn't need Armenian, they cannot understand Armenian, so they asked us to specifically translate the memoir to be published in English first and then the Armenian version would, would come next. But once we got a sense of the story, well this this guy, Paul Shadikian, after his altercation with Simon Zavarian, which is a fascinating episode of itself, is expelled from the party for a few years and then he rejoins the party in the United States. He, he was a member of so when we, when we first read the, the story, this, this sounds like a very unlikely story. It was fascinating in its details, graphic details, but there was not a single um, kind of reminiscence from, from this person. 
It was not until we saw a, a, a eulogy published in the newspaper Hayuni, and uh, a eulogy written by Malchas, the famous Armenian writer Malchas, about Boaz Shalik and his role in the Khastur expedition that we thought, okay, this guy really exists and he, he's, telling, he's telling the truth. So that's, that's uh, about the conditions of the production, but I'm assuming probably in the 1930s or, or 40s. He, he died in 1951, so we don't have an exact date of when this was written or who was the intended audience, but I'm assuming because he's really critical of some members of the party and he's really sim uh, sympathetic to other, let's say, party elites, for example, he's very, very close friends with Christophe Borbicaglia. He, he used to go with him on, uh, on tours in the Balkans, in Europe, and he, he speaks very highly of Christophe Borbicaglia. He doesn't think Zavalian should be the revolutionary work. He, he thinks he should be a farmer instead. <laughs> so, I, this, is, this is actually his words. And there are, I guess, interesting omissions in, in the memoirs, especially in a post-genocidal context where the ARF, the Amateur Cooperation Collaboration, is not really a spoken highly of, and people actually criticize that retrospectively. He doesn't speak any single word on the Young Turks. He doesn't even mention the Young Turks between the period 1902, between 1907, when he was the most active and when the Young Turks were the most active. And there were constant negotiations between Christoph Borbicaria until his death in 1905 and the Young Turks. So he doesn't have any word on, on that issue. So I'm, we're thinking this is a very conscious omission on his part. Uh, for more concrete examples of profane or mundane things or even anomalies in, in, the, in the story, for example, before they go on to this expedition in a, in a small village next to the city of Gars, there's this kind of known Armenian commander, Khan, uh, Parsef Tiliakian, who is actually the commander of the entire expeditionary group. And he actually addresses all the participants in Turkish because he doesn't know Armenian. So he Tradikian actually translates his Turkish for the participants who are coming from Iran, from the Caucasus, and from the Ottoman Empire. So this is really, from our perspective in the 21st century, this is really an anomaly that we cannot really make sense of. Other, I would say, profane or mundane aspects, so uh, we're not really used to read stories of the, the the militants of the Fidais kind of social life. So he gives us a good glimpse of that by saying we got drunk by drinking wine, we were having a party in this tavern, and then we went on to a different place. So you can see this kind of human aspect in how these people were actually interacting with the environment, and he felt that he falls in love, and then he goes to, to Europe. And these kind of very human, human stories that you can find in the memoirs. For the subfields, well, this, uh, the paper is a, is a kind of short version of the introduction, so this isn't the entire introduction, but we think this really contributes well to kind of the history of social movements in the 19th and 20th century, how people were participating in social movements, and how elites were mobilizing people, so these kind of elite entrepreneurs, social entrepreneurs, how they were recruiting people, why people decided to join them, and in a way, this is, a, this is an, an extrapolation on Louis Berberian's book, The Moving Revolutionaries, because we do think that this guy is a, a case by excellence of these, these rolling revolutionaries going between Iran, the Caucasus, and the Ottoman Empire as a middleman, not as a revolutionary elite. He was, he was not a Christophe Mikhailian, he was not an Avedis Nazarbayan, all these kind of intelligentsia of revolutionary founders, but he was a middleman who was just taking part in different ventures. So I guess that it would contribute to these kind of connected histories as well. Is that why he Well, there's a lot about him, but he, I don't think he left, he left any correspondences. Yeah. Yes. Just let me ask a question before Pedro's this time, because otherwise he's just going to take time. <laughs> 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 
Um, this is for Nora. I thought your paper was great, um, and I think it's it's really promising the direction you're going in. I think that um, I, I'm not super well read uh, on Western Armenian literary criticism, but from what I know, I think you're absolutely right that the provincial writers are much more neglected uh, in favor of the uh, Bolsahai uh, writers that you mentioned. Um, I also thought your point that about the short story being like a natural form to turn to uh, because of the tradition of Hekyat and Zeruits and Arabs was, was really nice and that would be worth like developing more. Um, one, one thing that struck me in, in these uh, two examples of like the travel towards the light um, that you might bring up as another way to contrast um, how provincial writers dealt with a similar theme as opposed to um, Constantinople writers is you might look at that poem of uh, Tango Varujan, um, I think it's called Luisa uh, from Heton Osirkev, where it's about like, uh, there's like the repeating line, yes, Gertan Tabiaf Pura Luisin. And in there, it's a totally different kind of approach uh, to this, where the light is the light of like, um, creative power and it's um, a more like neo-pagan sort of approach that's um, it, it just might be like a helpful way to even visibly contrast like the Bolsahai literary approach versus what they're doing in the provinces but uh, anyway I'm excited to see where your research goes. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Uh, Nora, did you have something to say in response, or? That, that, that um, comparison is, uh, seems to be a right one. Um, there are a couple other, um, there's actually another version by Tilkin and Zee with um, kind of a different outcome, um, as well as this idea of going towards some sort of source of wisdom or some sort of source of clarity um, that I might uh, want to, I think I'll probably further investigate. Um, the, the, com the comparison with Misa again was something that I was uh, very excited to find because, it, because like you mentioned, so, um, uh, it's so, it shows such a dark, uh, sharp contrast between how the two empires are thinking about the fight of Armenians. But what you just brought in with Vajran with, uh, seems like completely different, um, very center-specific, um, this, this, this neo-pagan uh, movement that was taking place. Um, but it's a good way to just, it, nothing else stylistically to discuss how the change, how the difference is um, in discussing this theme between the provinces and the, the center. So thank you, Olin, for that further. Thank you. Um, so yeah. <laughs> I think I'm going to go with Asya. Could you ask her something? Asya. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I'll just ask from here, even though it's not for Nora, but so that Nora also can hear uh, what uh, I, um, I had to say, just a tiny comment, which was, I think, fascinating about um, Anna mentioning uh, the Dashnak versus church uh, in the conversations <coughs> about um, revolutionary ideas and the development which was against the church that was actually uh, approving all these forced marriages. And it's just it, um, the yesterday conversation about uh, Dashnaks being uh, put together in the same basket with the church and then being thrown away by the Soviet Anastvats uh, newspaper. I think it's really interesting how it contrasts and um, shows us how we, we change our way of thinking um, throughout time and space. Uh, but my question actually is for Varag um, about um, some aspects of that memoir that you, at the end of your uh, last um, answer, uh, response mentioned about social life. I was just wondering about personal life. What part does that take in, if it, it is there in that memoir? Because uh, one of the things that we notice in memoirs written by female authors versus male is usually uh, sometimes absence of any personal relationships, especially family-related parts. 
Um, like you recently reviewed Petros Haroyan uh, as I did. And there is a lot of description and detail, but sometimes he even forgets uh, or leaves unending uh, the story of like mar getting married and then having a child or when was it happening. That usually never will happen in a female story. Um, like you will always have a complete story of where that child was and what happened to that child, right? So is there any um, personal story uh, besides friends, revolutionary friends, and um, uh, more male-dominated stories when it comes to social part of the memoir? Thank you. Yeah, well, uh, should I respond now? Yeah. 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 Thank you, thank you for the question, Asya. But by social life, I also meant personal life in the sense that the memoir is or at least we divided into two major parts. So after 1907, he has a short section, a section not very short, on his life in the United States, his family, his family relations. So we didn't really include that in this work because it kind of leaves out his, his revolution activism, which is the major focus of, of, the, of the first. You are of the first. <laughs> uh, so yeah, I should, I should, I should tell them. But, even in the first, even in the first section, uh, there are some stories of his kind of family in Drabizon, how where he was uh, educated, why he was sent to Venice, the role his uncle played, the, the the local priest, how his connection was to the local grocer, how he used these relations later on in his life to actually get a passport so that he can go to Batumi. So all these kinds of kinds of personal relations do come out in, in the text it's very clearly. Because the entire story is is pretty much constructed on these personal relationships because we are following his footsteps from one place to another and in every locality or in every place he go to, sometimes he has friends, sometimes he has cousins, distant relatives who actually help them in one help him in one way or another. I mean he also he since you said a very male-dominated kind of narrative, sometimes he has episodes where he goes to European, uh, let's say, cities or on the train, he sees a European girl, he kind of likes her, but then they kind of part ways. In an Armenian village, there's, a, there's an Armenian woman who he thinks likes him, and then he has to go do his revolutionary work, so he cannot really spend time with the woman. So all these kind of very human, very kind of personal stories I heard in the, in the, you know, more And we're going to include it? Yeah. Okay. So we stop when he actually goes to the United States, that's it, in 1907, because he doesn't come back. And then he, he actually lives the rest of his life in the United States. I mean, he is expelled from the party, but he found something in 1921 that he donated money for the Dalian trial, and then in 1951, when he, he, he passed away, this Malchus was writing a eulogy about him. But it was like a very short announcement that one of our veteran militants, Paul Shaligian, passed away on this day. Thank you. I think we'll go for five more minutes, so Mark and Dedos can ask <laughs> All right. Sure, Dedos, just uh, <laughs> can I have a few questions? Go, go, go up and ask. Go up and ask. Go up and ask. Yeah. <laughs> so while we're waiting for Ben, yeah. uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. All right, for hi Nora, how are you? Nora, a quick question regarding you mean borderland, it's a study itself, it's a field of study itself. Americans are really have developed this uh, field of border, border, border studies, uh, borderline studies, you know, so that's something that we, we need to, our department, for example, is really big into borderline studies. It's a field step. I always say, read something that's not in your field to understand what, how can it contribute to your field. That's one comment. Uh, Varak, uh, a few, few comments. Uh, I hope you discuss in your introduction regarding the uh, idealists and realists. Because in the end of the day, idealists are sitting in Tiflis and uh, and dreaming about Western Armenia, and whereas the people on the ground have a different view of what's, what's happening. I mean, 
in the end, and on the end of the day, Sharpedian was doing the dirty work, quote unquote, and clean work, or whatever you want to say, the dirty work. And to that extent, he's much more uh, aware about the real condition on the ground. For example, after 1908, many revolutionaries say we're not going giving up the weapons, you know, and people from Geneva, and, you know, and saying, no, this is a new beginning, etc. But people on the ground know the reality. This is one. Second thing I think, there needs to be a discussion here about memoirs. I mean, when a memoir studies itself as a field, so how are you going to contribute to that? I mean, I understand that you're looking at it from a historical perspective, but there needs to be a memoir from a memoir studies perspective. How does this contribute? I mean, you, go, you send an ego, what do you say, ego document? And I mean, memoir studies today within Armenian studies, it's a very large one. And we have 400 unpublished memoirs at the Armenian Genocide Museum, for example, unpublished memoirs, not hundreds outside. And the third and the last comment would be about your, I'm not going to use the word massacring the, uh, the thing, the uh, memoirs, but you re restructure the memoir. Is that an ethical thing to do when it comes to someone who has written a memoir and you are, this is similar to the same case, for example, Kani, Kani Panyan's book, Goodbye Atura. This is an abridged and re repolished and polished and polished version which is aimed to deliver something much more clearer to the, to the... So is this authentic? Is this honest way of doing it? I'm not saying you're dishonest, but is this... Are you, are you really, you know... Are you really being honest to the real words, the real structure of the, of the memoir itself? And finally, last but not least, uh, uh, Anna, uh, about the periodization of the Humoradib? Periodization. Do you see major shifts in both terms of argument about feminism, about women's rights, in the pre-revolution period and post-revolution period, and even afterwards. So. It was short. Mm -hmm. Let's get Mark's question and well, mm -hmm. but if you want to <laughs> uh, Sure. Um, I think everybody can hear me. I'm loud, but. Uh, Maybe Nora can't. Nora, I, these were all great papers, as in fact have all the papers been. Um, but Mara, question about the memoirs and their their under use or lack of use by by historians uh, for the most part. You talked about some of the possible reasons for that. I would add probably another reason, and, and that is that the because so much of the discussion has been structured by denial, the, the existence of revolutionary memoirs has been used, of course, as evidence of the justification for the, the genocide that didn't occur, if you, if you follow my uh, twisted reasoning. Uh, so we're now hopefully at a point, not past denial, but where these memoirs can be incorporated in, into the scholarship in a, in a more uh, uh, responsible and comprehensive way. And Nora, uh, I, I don't know about if there is any literature on these provincial writers to speak of in Armenian. There certainly isn't much, as you say, in English. Peter Cowley has written a little bit, uh, maybe Peter Valedian in, in French. Um, but they, uh, they're provincial writers, but they were published, at least some of their work was published in, in Constantinople. Of course. So how were they? And Ismir, yeah, right. Uh, so how were they read and discussed in their own time out of the provinces, in, in the in the capitals and, and intellectual centers? Uh, and Anna, uh, I'm sorry you served us raw food, but I like your so thank you. <laughs> Yeah, that is an ethical question, and we, we did think about it a lot, but when we first got the memoirs, PDF copies of five notebooks that did not have any chronological structure, so it was really impossible to make sense of the story without giving some form of a structure as to where his life begins in Darwinism and where, or at one point, he actually goes to the United States. So we, we didn't change the text, but we just kind of uh, reordered it so that we can follow a clear chronological narrative. 
And this actually pushes me to, to think that this was not intended for publication. Probably he just wrote down for himself or for his family. Otherwise, I, I would assume that he would have structured it in a more comprehensive, chronologically comprehensive narrative. So in each book, first draft, many times people then recombine them. I mean, this is this is this is all we we have, so we don't know much about the conditions of of its of its. Right. Even each volume does not follow chronological order, so it's messed up. The whole thing. Yeah. So even in the same notebook, he makes kind of uh, flashbacks and references to an earlier period. For example, when he's discussing something in the early 1900s. He goes back, devotes a few pages to what he was doing in Marseille in 1896. So you just have to follow this very, very kind of messy chronology. Otherwise, you wouldn't really understand what he, what he's saying. So we just had to give some kind of uh, some kind of chronology to this man. Do you preserve that order, though? Do you know what his kind of stream of consciousness was? Well, we don't preserve it because we start with his childhood. I mean, the, the ten chapters that we divided yeah. is basically how we structure the narrative. Yes. That I mean, if in notebook number five, yeah, is talking about his childhood, but in notebook number two, he's talking about his activism in the in the Caucasus. Just because notebook is number two doesn't mean it should actually be cut come first. So we actually had to put notebook number five at first because it's about his childhood and then follow his chronology based on what he's saying. Also he doesn't give us a lot of dates. Yeah. Did so, he number the notebooks himself or the family? I, I think we need to understand from the family how this was put together. But what was their intervention through the categorization? What? That was for both the problems. Uh, I mean, yes, I mean, I'm a little bit skeptic because we know that the family does not read Armenian, so probably they did not do anything with the memoir, they just had it and yeah. knew that this was, this belonged to their grandfather or great uncle. Yeah, but that his children might know, I mean, maybe the grandchildren don't know it, so maybe the children in between, okay, they, they did the number. But the notebooks exist as they are in their stream of consciousness order, is that correct? You didn't know. We don't know. Oh, we don't. I, I, I can't. I, I don't remember. I need to check the, the uh, PDF of volumes. So I'll, I'll do yeah. after this. But yeah, we just had to give some sure. form of chronology to the entire memoirs. In general, we publish the Armenian tools. We will publish them. But in the original category. You know, in the way we structure it. <laughs> <laughs> will the reader be able to tell where a particular passage came from in the narrative? In, in the notebooks, or are you defacing that information? Because that is really at least an appendix or something that can be of what the original order was. I mean, the, the reader will not see the original. He, will, he or she will read the translated version. But in like an appendix, you could have marked by sections how you yes. move things around so people could know sure, what it was. I want to say that's fairly standard to all the years. I mean, but the thing is, there is no chronology in the in the novel. I mean, the question is, like, are you publishing from an academic audience? You're putting all the emphasis on chronology, but we don't know that was what was important to him. Like, he wasn't necessarily writing a, a history or a chronology. He was writing, like, thoughts and memories, perhaps, personal things as they came. But I don't know, I think that it's not necessarily it doesn't seem like it's necessarily the right approach to put all that emphasis on chronology. I mean, we do tell in the, in, the, in the longer introduction that this is how we structured the, the narrative. This is not how the author actually wrote the text. So we, we are clear on that, saying that he just writes as he thinks. He writes what he thinks is important, but he doesn't really follow any, any narrative. So in that case, you need to put your surname on the book, on the cover of the book. I mean, we'll say it's a memoir is written by this person, Shabibian, and we're just editing the memoirs and trying to put it in a larger context. I think the solution is easy. Yeah, put the original text in the appendix, as yes. you say, and then maybe in the footnotes, uh, the paragraphs, it was taken from volume one. Okay. 
keep your keep your structure. So the, 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 the entire no, no just num have a numbering system for the sections. Like I don't know how many there are. Are there a hundred a hundred sections that you reshuffle? Maybe there's fifty. You could have them numbered, and then in some way in the appendix, like here's the original order of these, and so the person at least could reconstruct themselves what yes. came after what yes. in the original. Yes. Uh, otherwise, that's totally lost, and that could be important for uh, present and unforeseen reasons. You know, maybe people want to do a study on uh, how how someone's life was remembered, how trauma influenced like memory or things like that. I, 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 I guess this connects to the first questions about the the perspectives on the memoir studies uh, kind of field, and I think here the the value lies that. We're just trying to understand the idiosyncrasies of, of this person as he is remembering his revolutionary past in a post-genocidal context. What he omits from his narrative and what he thinks is important to remember. And I think this also relates to Mark's, Mark's question about denialism and the usage of memoir, because all the memoirs that are, that are published, or several of these memoirs, were published because someone thought they are worth publishing because they are important in X, Y, or Z. So I guess this also tells how the Armenian historiography is shaped by these memoirs and how some other memoirs are left out because, as I said, they're not very coherent in terms of fitting well with the overall narrative of the Armenian Revolutionary Movement. So I, don't, I, I personally don't think you would find any published memoirs where one person would tell Simon Zavarion that you should be a farmer instead of a revolutionary. This doesn't really fit well with the overall narrative. But part of the point is that the voice of the writer should be kept and respected. That's the whole thing here. As he, when even he's passing along different phases in his writing, that's important from the perspective of the analyzer and the analysis perspective as to why you know, memory studies, for example, that, that's very important, I think. So, I think if you ask me, I think the best way to avoid this keep your thing, but put the original in the end, or put an appendix that say that this was taken. So, in the future, people would want to say, you know, you, you restructure the whole thing, but then you can say, you know, we need to restructure this is the, this is the flow of the whole uh, memoirs, the five volumes, and we just restructure it, and this is the original. So, I don't know if the original can be printed, it should be printed if you ask me. As a, as a, as even a copy, you know, as a copy of the original or translated or put translated. online. Yes. Yeah. 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 I, I was thinking about it, like the very original the newspapers themselves in his handwriting can be maybe on Nasser's side or something, yeah. so you just that's yeah, it. that's another way. Yeah. Online. I mean, that's so that they, should be the family's decision if they well, you publish add, yeah. the original notebooks. Because yes, the, the translation is already around 300 pages, so if we're going to put the original as well, that would be a very thick book. People should have access, if you're publishing the book, I think people should have access to it. Uh, I have some comment. Uh, uh, when you are talking about this, uh, I remember the Kortasas, I don't know in English, Tsatkapa, when he has different kind of numbering, and uh, you can read the uh, same story in the different way. So you can do uh, two uh, numbering of the pages. Two ways of reading. Well, now, now that I said, I was thinking, uh, we do have a numbering in the uh -huh. text for our purposes to see what, where this passage actually is in the actual notebook. But I'm not sure we'll, we'll publish that as well. That's something that the editor should decide as well. But I'll, I'll take it if you want. It's a good situation. Uh, both are important. It sounds like you did a lot of hard work to do what you did. And I just think it could be generative to look at both together, right? So it's like a chronology is important, and he didn't provide that. We've done work to do that. But if you can even have a link to the original text so someone can go, you don't have to do all that extra work, but to think about how these two speak to each other and the difference in narrative and what that tells you and really what that gap tells you, it's really powerful. So yeah. there's just an opportunity. Nora might want to say something, though. Mm -hmm. cool. Oh, Nora? Yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> 
uh, in response to. Okay. Um, and I so think this will be the final because we've gone 30 minutes over on this panel, so I'll give you the last word. <laughs> Just a, quick, just a quick response as for how um, these pieces were actually discussed in the center. Um, you can kind of see um, that it slowly becomes more interesting in the center um, with pieces, like like I mentioned, the Tilde Kuzi piece was published in Istanbul, and um, you'll slowly start seeing, um, for example, Mel Kukjan publishes a series of um, articles in, I think it was Masi's, at the behest of uh, the request of Arpiyan Arpiyan to discuss the, the how the, the Bantuks um, experience going from the, the, the provinces to um, to the center. So he publishes a series of short, short stories. So there's clearly a, a growing interest in what these people are experiencing, at least um, <clears throat> at least specifically that migration going from the, the, the periphery, the, the borders, the provinces to the center. Um, as for how what the responses were, the specific responses, I haven't uh, just I haven't really. Uh, Explored that yet, but um, there is definitely <clears throat> there. Um, I, I don't know exactly what the what I would say the cutoff point was, but the, you do uh, slowly see um, interest in in these regions that were were neglected in these um, in these periodicals in the center that were not discussed. That they slowly begin to be discussed, and um, that also kind of leads into that discussion of you know Malcolm Kyuchan was from the provinces, but he spent a lot of time in 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 the center, and he's writing about the experience of the Bantu from the provinces. So like when I consider him um, a provincial writer, I'm not sure, um, but uh, and then but that's that's a great question. I'll again also have to figure out how to incorporate into my final paper. Okay, thank you. This is a topic that is obviously very dear to my uh, to my work, but uh, I, I'm not going to say everything. Maybe I can speak to everybody individually because we have gone over time. I think maybe we'll have a 15-minute break and then do the concluding session. Uh, is so that zooming our yes. quarter at six? We have to be at Alma. Okay. So we have to move from here five forty. So make it like a 10 minute break now. Ten yeah, minutes. okay. Oh, we have to take the picture. Okay. Thank you, Nara. Please sit down. You can thank them, but they're not there. Okay, okay we're going to resume. 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 <laughs> Uh, Pedros. Friends, countrymen. Yes, on the meeting. Romans. 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 Well, we're at the end now. Um, it's such a great honor to offer a few closing remarks upon this conference, and it's a distinct pleasure to do so in such beautiful and comfortable surroundings. I repeat my colleagues' words, words when I say how much I have enjoyed and learned from the presentations, and no less seeing real faces and bodies in three dimensions. I want to, I want to thank Petros and Mark for their superb leadership. Nasser for its unflagging hospitality. I want to thank Zobinar and Chris for a truly inspiring and inspired conceptualization, and the speakers for their individual contributions. Each panel offered something important to share and to learn from. The first panel yesterday considered four very different forms of writing, the poetics of medieval manuscripts, Russian imperial periodicals, and their accounts of refugees from the Armenian Genocide, Armenian atheist publications, and finally, the banners and posters of the Karabakh movement. These talks clearly show the agency of literary and visual forms, not just as reflections of reality, but as actors in the making of reality. The second panel this morning focused on questions of identity, beginning with the late antique period, in a talk which asked, how did history writing reveal Armenia's relation to the world and what it meant to be Armenian? 
And we then fast forwarded to the period of the Ottoman and British Mandate Jerusalem to consider approaches to the history of photography and the role of Armenians within it. And the last paper focused on the role of the sacred object in the making of Armenian identity during and after the genocide. The third panel drew together three very different perspectives on Armenian literary forms, from the fascinating world of Humayils to the voice of the everyday, as gleaned through the diary of Yeremia Komurjan, and finally, with the extraordinary TO map and its relations to European prototypes. In each case, we were provided original and innovative perspectives on loan on known literary forms. The final panel asked if the provinces could speak, and I think we saw very well what the answer was. Each paper attuned us to the voices of the provinces through a range of texts and textual genres. The short stories produced by rural Armenians of the eastern provinces, the gender-based issues related to women through the Khamonati press, and finally through the memoirs of the ARF revolutionary Bobas Shadik. Thus, the speakers took us from late antiquity to the modern period, from Artsakh to Jerusalem, and from Constantinople to the eastern provinces. They looked at the epic and the everyday. They brought to light, brought to light modest objects and lesser-known genres. They gave voice to the subaltern, presented regional and micro-histories, and told history as from below. This conference, conference thus reflects and embodies an important change in the way we approach history, literature, and culture and demonstrates the present and powerful engagement of Armenian studies with a whole range of other fields and approaches. And I was struck myself by the combination of rigor and traditional analysis with innovative questions, methods, and conclusions. So please join me in thanking everyone here for a wonderful conference and other people who are here. <laughs> Now there's time for, for a general discussion. Uh, yes, I guess if there are any questions.